All right, take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John. The Bible teaches that there is only one God. The Bible teaches that this God was in Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches that God was from the beginning. If God was from the beginning, and if God is what the Bible says He is, Spirit, God is Spirit, John 4, 24, then God cannot be born. God cannot be born. The Bible says God was in whom? Christ. That's a lot different. But the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ was born. Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem of Judea in a stable laid in a manger. Jesus Christ was born God cannot be born. God is eternal. Now, of course, the argument has always been in every commentary and among all the church groups, denominationally speaking, basically, the large church groups, the National Council outfit especially, that Jesus Christ was coexistent with God that Jesus Christ was with God in the beginning. Now they teach this and use as their scripture that one in Genesis. <coughs> let us make man in our image and let them have dominion and so forth. Now, this is no proof of Jesus as being back there because the us is simply used in the plural form to speak of the greatness of the, the, the incident to which God related himself. Like the Queen of England, the Queen of England, who is supposed to represent the British Empire, which is getting smaller and smaller, but she, when she speaks for all the British Empire, she says, we, the Queen of England, and she isn't we. <laughs> That's right. But you see, it's in the plural. She says, the Queen of England, us. This is the same sense grammatically and English-wise that the King James men use when they say, let us make man in our image after our likeness and so forth in Genesis. So the first thing you must understand is that God is eternal. Jesus Christ. Christ was born. Now, if you set this right, then you have to work the word to fit in it. You don't have to, the word has to fit in it. Let's put it that way. They have all read Gen, uh, John 1 1 as follows In the beginning was Jesus Christ. This is what they've read. And Jesus Christ was with God, and Jesus Christ was God. That is not what it says. It says in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I will need a set of my foundational notes to teach. Now, the problem in John 1.1 1, 1 is naturally who is the Word, or what is the Word, right? That's the problem. In Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, what does it say in the first line? In the beginning, God, God, God. Now, it does not say in the beginning God and Jesus Christ. It says in the beginning God. Only one God, and that God was in the beginning, and God is spirit. And it is God who is the Word with a capital W, a capital O, a capital R, and a capital D. The reason the word, word. Now, I also know that Jesus Christ is the word, which we'll get to, so just don't go jumping yet. 
The reason God is the Word is because God is spirit. And spirit cannot communicate with your brain cells, with your mind, with your reason. Everything has to stay in its category. Spirit to spirit, things in the senses world can be known this way. You people just been in the class have learned all this recently. Word is communication. Communication. Word means communication. God's communication to man is why the word word is used in the Bible. The word logos. It's, it's this word, logos. That is the Greek word, translated word. And there are two elements in here that we really must notice. In the beginning was the Word, God. This agrees with Genesis 1-1 and many other places. And the Word was with God. Now, here is now our first problem. And God was with God is how you, you would say, no, 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 no. There are only two basic manifestations in the senses world of God. One is the written word here. This written word, now you know what I mean, not the King James, but the word, when it's rightly divided, so on and so forth. This written word is as much God as God is God. It's just as genuine as God. This written word is God's manifestation of himself in the revealed world. Because God is spirit. For God to manifest himself in the senses world, in writing, so that it could be understood it had to be in form of words, W-O-R-D-S. This is why the Bible is referred to as the Word, number one. Had we placed before, in, the, in that phrase, before the word Word revealed, it would make sense and be biblically accurate. It would read then as follows. In the beginning was the Word, God, and the revealed Word was with who? God. All right, now let's talk. How was, how was this Word with God? All right. Is God omniscient? All wise? All right. Did he know from before the foundations of the world that when man was formed, made, and created that man would sin? Did he know before the foundation of the world that Christ would have to come to redeem? If you don't admit that, then you will have to admit that God is not all wise. And in the soup, big soup. Then you, you contradict yourself in the Bible too because the Bible says he is. He knew from before the foundation of the world even that you would be born again. He knows your end even before your beginning. To this, this is exactly what it means. And if I can use a phrase without being misunderstood, this is what I would say. That in the mind of God, in the mind of God, this whole revealed word the Bible was already with him in the beginning. That's what it means. The Word, the revealed Word, was with God. This revealed Word is manifested in the Bible, in writing in the Bible. 
And the Word was with God. Last phrase. And the Word was with God. If you'll put the word creative before word, you'll have its true meaning. And the creative word, which is Jesus Christ, was with God. Now, how was Jesus Christ with God in the beginning? The same way the revealed word was with him. In the mind of God. Later on, he were going to read, he was in the bosom of the Father. Because God knew, God knew that Jesus Christ would have to come and redeem man because man would sin. Therefore, God from the beginning had this Jesus Christ with him, the same as the, re the revealed word was in God. Later on, the prophets made it known, holy men of God spake it, they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And when the fullness of time came, Jesus Christ was born. This is what that verse says, and this is what it means with great spiritual understanding. But now, even without great spiritual understanding, I can prove this logically and from every segment of the Word of God. For there are, in order to manifest yourself, if your spirit to manifest yourself in concretion, it must be via Word. Locus, this. And there are only two ways. There are only two ways that God has done this if the Bible is right. He has done this basically all through the years through his revealed word, which is the Bible, manifested in writing in the Bible, and secondly, manifested creatively in his Son, Jesus Christ. That is why I know that what we believe and teach on this verse is accurate. Because it's backed up, Bob, with all the rest of the Word of God. Now verse 2. The same. The same what? The same revealed Word and created Word. Creative Word was with God. The same was in the beginning with what? Now, this is, this is a repetition of what we just read in verse 1, right? Why is it twice? Grad. No, no. Huh? No. Come on. Who said that? Amen, Eddie. What did I teach you in the advanced class if anything is given twice? Twice. It's figure, but it's bigger than this. It's, it's a figure of speech, but it's established. Whenever God, whenever God puts anything double, whenever it's doubled in the Word, it's always established. And this is so great. This is so magnificent, so wonderful, that God wrote it. Holy men of God, they wrote it, and God said, write it right over, so that when the people at the way headquarters read it, they'll know it's established. <laughs> Well, I don't know anybody else reading it. Isn't that right? Why, the commentaries don't know what they're talking about. That's why I put it in here. It's established. Now, there is one word in here that really puts the clincher on this thing, and that's the preposition with. W-I-T-H. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Those two with, W-I-T-H. The Greek word used is the word pros. Pros, P-R-O-S. There are, oh, I don't know, 15, 20 different prepositions. Five or six of them all translated with. But there's only one that fits here. If this particular one was not here, your Bible would fall to pieces. It's that important. This word pros, used here, this preposition with, 
If any of the other prepositions, John, were used, you wouldn't have a leg to stand on. But this one sets it like a vice. It just puts her there and squeezes the life out of you. Because the word pros means together, to gather, this is supposed to be an E. My brother Harry said after the television day, even I was learning to write. <laughs> now that's a compliment from him. Because I was going to send a letter to someone a while back or do something, and he was supposed to sign it, and he said, boy, he said, I never signed my name to that because I'd written it. How uh, I write it? Oh, pros. It means to gather with this is what its basic meaning is, together with and yet distinct, independence. Uh -huh. That's something. That's the word pros, with. Together with and yet distinctly independent. All right? Now look, the revealed word. The written word was to gather with, was to gather with God, and yet this is distinctly what? Smell it, taste it, that's something. All right, how about, about Jesus Christ? Isn't that wonderful? Oh, praise the Lord. If that doesn't throw your heart, you're hopeless. God, this just... This just takes it out of the category of guesswork and puts it into semantic, logical sequence and order with the great accuracy of, of, of law that's used in language. The word pros, always, whenever it's used in the Bible, this word pros always means to gather with, but yet it is distinct and independent. Distinct independence. That's why in the beginning was God and the revealed word was with God, with him, yet independent of him. And the word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. That's why it's used in that sense. Okay. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> You know, verse 2 literally could read, the same written word, Bible, was, well, the same written word, Bible, and created word, Christ, was in the beginning with God. Odds could read. Verse 3. Perhaps... Before we get to verse 3, we ought to turn to John 5. If I remember correctly, Rachel Wine, you were the one that called this to my attention this summer. John 5. And she was in this class this summer when I taught this originally. And she called our attention to something here that I think we ought to be reminded of again tonight. Verse 36, John 5. He says, I have greater witness than that of whom? For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath what? Okay, the Father, in other words, the Father God sent him. And the Father himself, verse 37, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his what? And yet out of the midst of the bush, the voice, you got to explain it. That's something. His shape, God is spirit. Spirit has no form, right? Verse 38, And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent, for whom he hath sent him, ye believe not. The point I want to make is that God sent him. It was an God 
Jesus Christ was in God, it was God who did what? Sent him. Sure, bless your hearts. Now, we're going to verse 3. You understand God's communication to man in one sense was in the Bible, manifested in writing in the Bible, manifested in his only begotten Son in Jesus Christ. Now, verse 3. All things were made by God. That's him. And this again agrees with Genesis 1.1, right? Sure. And without God was not anything made that was made. In him, verse 4, in God was what? Life. And the life, this life that was in God, was the light of men. How, how was this life which was in God, how was this the light of men? It was the light of men via the revelation which was given to the men of God who spoke it and wrote it. That's how it is. In other words, it was both, Bob, it was both spiritual see, and written. It was spiritual light Spiritual light given to the men of God, prophets, understand? Spoken and written. Not everything, you, you know this, don't you? That not everything God showed to the prophets was written. The prophets many times spoke the word of God, which was never written. I forget how how I really got that settled in my heart, but some critic had taken a crack at the Bible a couple years ago, and I read what, what he said. And then I looked it up in the Bible, and it didn't say God wrote it. It said the prophet spoke so, so and so. <laughs> didn't say it was written. That was a terrific thing for me. Well, why not? Not everything God's ever revealed to man is recorded here. But that which is needed for our salvation and for our learning and addressed to us is recorded here. So this is what verse 4 means when it says, and the life was the light of men. Do you understand that? By a revelation, both spiritual and written. Spiritually, it came through men of God who spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, and they either spoke it or it was written. Now verse 5. And the light shineth in darkness. How did it shine in darkness? Via these men who either spoke it or wrote it. The written word still shines in darkness. Understand? And the darkness comprehended it what? Why? Because you cannot, darkness cannot comprehend light. That's something. Really something. If we lit this little candle, turn out all these bright lights, would the increase of the darkness put this light out? Isn't it funny that just one little light is bigger than all the darkness? Man, if I could preach or take a half hour off to preach, I'd go to work now. Just imagine what you could do with that for a sermon some Sunday morning if you were a preacher. Huh? Couldn't you just thrill the hearts of the people with it? That as long as there's one little person in that congregation who is a light, all the darkness of that community couldn't put that light out. Well, bless God, there ought to be some light in Dayton and Xenia, New Knoxville, New Bremen. Right? And all hell can't put that light. All the darkness in the world can't put it out. It's wonderful. Well, I'm not preaching, so we'll get along. Now, verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light. Who's the light? God. When we get to Jesus, I'll let you know. We haven't arrived yet. Pardon? 
Yeah, sure. You already know all these answers. I don't know why you come on Sunday night. Do you? I... Hey, we're going to get to you after a bit because the word Thelma is used in this text. Yeah. <laughs> you haven't. I thought of that this afternoon when I was working on this. I have never told you about Thelma. What Thel Do you know what the word Thelma means? Do you know what the name Thelma means? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Verse 7. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light who is God that all through him, through God, might do what? He was not that light. He was not that God, but sent, was sent to bear witness of God. That was the true light. God was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. How does it light every man that cometh into the world? By the revealed word of God. Old Testament. That's how it lighted every man that came in the world. Do you know that the true light, the word of God, still lights every man, even the unbeliever? Without the true light of the word of God, there would be total darkness. That's why it still lights even for the unbeliever. He was in the world. Did I read verse 9? Yes. He was in the world. Verse 10. How was he in the world? God. How was God in the world? By the revealed word. By the revealed word. And the world was made by who? By God. This again agrees with Genesis, doesn't it? And the world knew him what? Not. Verse 11. He, God, he, God, came unto what? His own. Who are his own? Israel. Right. And his own, Israel, received him what? Not. Verse 12. But as many as received him, how? via the revealed word and the prophets, as many as received God via the revealed word and the prophets, to them gave he power to become the sons of God to them that believe on his name. Now here we, we have to go to work. Uh, but as many as received him, via the revealed word in the prophets, to them gave he power. The word power is the word authority. It is not that word dynamis or energimata and so forth that I teach in the class. Entirely different word. To them gave he the authority, the right, the right, R-I-G-H-T, to become to become children of God. To them that continue believing on his name. That's the text. Boy, oh boy, you better get that and down because that's really something. <laughs> Here we go. I'll try it again. I, I, I... Okay. Now, but as many as received him, then comes the explanation, which is via the revealed word and prophets. That's not in the text, you know, that's the explanation. To them gave he authority or right to become children or sons of God, whichever one you like to use. The Greek word is the word wheels. To them. To them. Now, in your King James, it says that believe, right? Sons of God, to them that believe on his name. The text literally should be translated to them 
who continue believing on is the word ice e-i-s the preposition ice uh unto unto uh euclid the mathematician uses this word constantly matter of fact he's a real brain in the usage of prepositions because all prepositions are mathematically accurate in the Bible. And Euclid, you've got a Euclid Avenue up there someplace in Cleveland. Got one over in Dayton, I believe. Here is the point you want to go to. Here's the point you want to arrive at. Euclid uses this mathematical thing as this would be the starting point. It'd go all the way through till it reached that. That's un. To them who continue believing unto his name. Do you get this? He had Israel, right? And Israel only stayed saved as long as they kept on what? Believing. That's what it's talking about. That's why it's so important. They were not sons of God by birth. They were sons of God by what? Adoption. And God adopted Israel when they believed. When they believed, he reckoned righteousness unto them. And it's unto, unto ice, unto. Right? into, unto, way through, on his name, God's name. Now, this terminates with, with the name, unto his name. Now, what is that name in the scriptures? His name, Jesus Christ, which is above what? Every name, and Abraham saw his day back. Now you see why that verse is so important. As many as received him, to them gave he right or authority to become the sons of God to those who continue to believe, looking for the coming of Christ. He reckoned righteousness, looking back after the resurrection. He gave it to Israel, remember? Now the next verse starts with Jesus Christ. Verse 13 is where Jesus comes in. And that's why I explain this name to you now, which you all know, because his name is above every name, and that's why it's unto. All the way through, Bob, all the way through from the original, all the way through unto his name, which is Christ. Now we get to Jesus Christ. The first word which is the word who in the text. Who was born? Who was born? The word born is the same word as the word begotten. <coughs> Who was begotten? Plural. Is it plural? Well, I, I, I don't know. I, uh, shoot, I looked that up this afternoon, I believe. I, uh, I don't know. Uh, Ricky or any of you boys, is, is that word in that verse in the singular or plural? If um, somebody's got a critical Greek text in here, I have a look at it. You've got one laying next to you there, Paul. I must have worked it. I uh, can't remember now whether I really checked that word out in the plural or it didn't. Oh, I mean, no, the, it is past, it's not plural, it's past tense or something. Huh? Was, were... Well, it has to be was, so just find your text. Uh, just show me the Greek word. You're, I don't care about the English word underneath. I want to see see that Greek word. Pass it up here once. That's what I thought it was. Yeah. Should be was. 
should be was. Well, anyways, verse 13, back again. Who was born not of blood? Uh... <laughs> You and I are born of blood. All Israel was born of blood. Hebrews 2.14 The children are partakers of flesh and what? The only one who did not partake of blood is Jesus Christ. Therefore, this verse has to be on Jesus. Who was born not of blood, meaning this kind of thing is going on nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, here we have Christ being conceived. Was God again creating? And when God creates, he brings into existence that which has not been before. And in Mary, he had Mary over here, so what he created in here was soul life. He created soul life. And this is exactly what it says. Now, here we get to Thelma. Did you, you didn't see your name in this verse, did you? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, Thelma is a Greek word. It just has an extra E in it. That's all. There's your name. And the word will in here is the word Thelma. Huh? <laughs> Now I want, pardon? Well, yeah, we get to here in a minute. We're going to talk about Thelma a little bit now. The word Thelma. Which were born not of blood, nor of the Thelma of the flesh. There are a number of different words used in the Bible for will. One word Thelma means, the word Thelma means desire. <laughs> now she'll most likely go home when I tell her the rest. So. It means desire, but not determination or resolve. When a person has, when, when, he, when God has determined or resolved to carry it out, it's an entirely different will. When he simply desires, anticipates, so on and so forth, it's the word will, they'll tell me. That's why this word is used here, and it's wonderful in usage. Look at it again. It's far beyond what just you hit with the first time you go across it with your senses, mind. Which were born, not of blood, nor of the desire of the flesh, nor of the desire of man, because man with his Thelma, you know, his desire, he, he might want this Christ, you know, like all the women looked for the Christ, but they could only will, only desire. They could not will it. Get that boy, isn't that fabulous in that context, huh? They could never have the determination and say, well, now we're going to produce Jesus. Not according to the will of the flesh, flesh-wise, Every woman was made that way to bring the Christ. We know that. And the will of man was, if they could have, you know, they would have determined, but the will of man could not determine it, for Jesus Christ was not born by man's will. He was born by the will of God, for he was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Then they talk about the accuracy of the word. They sit around and they wonder where they're going to find something that fits. Ma'am, they never study the book. It's why they don't know the greatness of God's Word. Just that usage of that word alone. And I got so blessed because this here was not on the tape. It's among other things that weren't on the tape. But this is one thing that wasn't on the tape. And I'd forgotten about it. I, apparently last summer I wasn't as far teaching. It. But it just blessed my heart. The difference between having a will to desire something and having a will that would determined and resolved to carry it out. Is that something? 
verse 14. And the Word was made flesh. The Word was made flesh is the conception. The Word was made flesh is the conception. And dwelt among us is the birth. Nine months later. And we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We beheld his glory because he was revealed, Jesus Christ, and the only begotten of the Father, only begotten, and he was full of divine favor, which is truth, truthfully divine. Well, that's all there's to it. Verse 18, this agrees with what we looked up in John 5. No man hath seen God at what? The only begotten Son, which is where? In the bosom of the Father. He has hexagomai, declared, you know, made manifest him. He hath declared him. Uh, the bosom of the Father... What did I say earlier it was? Did I say that? Well, I don't know what I said. Yeah, but I, I, I brought up in the bosom of the Father and I said later on we'll hit it in verse 18 or something. But anyway, if they got it on tape, I'll find out what I said when I listen to it. But... The bosom of the Father, whenever you read it, always means comfort and rest. Now, if I said he was in the mind of God, that it meant the bosom, that's perfectly all right. Because God was at rest over the whole thing. He knew what was coming anyways. Like Lazarus was in Abraham's, wasn't Lazarus in, who went in Abraham's bosom? No, the dive's bird, or what was his name? You know. The wicked fellow that Yeah, Lazarus was up there in Abraham's bosom, huh? Yeah. And then when this other fellow gets up there <laughs> Okay. <laughs> he didn't make it. Well anyways, the bosom of the father means comfort and rest. In other words, no, the, no man had seen the only begotten Son which is in the bosom. In the comfort and the rest of the Father who had all of this in mind from the beginning, this Christ has declared him. Now I'll handle one or two more difficult ones for you and then you can ask all the questions you want to maybe. We'll handle Colossians chapter 2 first. Because this is the one they'll always throw at you, so we might as well get it out in the open. Chapter 2, verse 15. Start with verse 14. In whom, in Jesus Christ, we have redemption through his blood, even the four... I'm in chapter 1. Sorry. Even the forgiveness of what? Sin. Verse 15. Who? Jesus Christ is the image of the what? Invisible God. Why is God invisible? For he is spirit. Jesus Christ was in concretion. The firstborn of every creature. Verse 16. For by him, this is how they read it, by him, by Jesus Christ, no. Verses 16 and 17 are a parenthesis, a figure of speech by way of explanation. It's a parenthesis. Parenthesis is put in by via way of explanation. And you make it a parenthesis and it'll fit like a hand in a glove. Let me read it to you then. Oh, by the way, when you put a parenthesis in, any time a parenthesis fits, you can go from the, word, the, the last word preceding the parenthesis to the next verse after it without losing anything. So we'll do that first, from 15 to 18. 
who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, and he is the head of the body, the church, which is... See it? Who is the head of the body? Jesus Christ. Now, verse 16, For by him, by God, were all things created. If people say all things were created by Jesus Christ, which all commentaries say, and everybody says, then they contradict the first verse of the first chapter of the first book of the Bible. In the beginning, God created. For by God were all things created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by God and for who? Amen. For God. And he, God, is before all things, and by God all things cohere, consist. The word, cons the word consist is the word cohere. Stick together. Sure. All right, the next one is Hebrews. Chapter 1. Verse 2 is the difficult verse. By the way, verse 1 fits right in the context of what I've been teaching tonight. God, who at various times, sundry, various times and in many different manners or ways, spake in times past unto the fathers, how? By the prophets, see? Hath in these last days, in this last time now, spoken unto us by his Son, whom... He, the word hath is not in the text, whom he, God, appointed heir of all things. I forgot that preposition by. I've got to look it up. Is it here with the genitive or the accusative case? What's it used here? English. English. What's, what's it used in English here? Genitive or accusative? It has to be accusative. It has to be accusative. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and in the accusative case for whom also, or for whom, he made the ages, all of the ages that are still to come also. And that's what it means. by whom, you know, by whom he made the worlds is not true. It's for him that the ages are made, for all things are made for him. 